Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Sebastien Quichio, and I'm here today with Frédéric Ernst. Today, we're speaking with Paul Frambeau, who is CEO of Morpho Labs. Morpho Labs is building the Morpho Protocol, which is a DeFi protocol that allows you to improve your borrow and lend APY on, uh, on lending protocols. So before we talk to Paul, I'd like to tell you about our sponsors this week. Omni is your new favorite multi-chain wallet. Omni supports more than 25 protocols, so you can access all of your access your assets in one place. But what's really special about Omni is what you can do inside the wallet. If you want to get yield, Omni allows you to get the best APYs with zero fees in three taps. If you need to swap, Omni aggregates all major bridges and DEXs, so you can bridge and swap across all supported networks in one transaction directly in your wallet. If you love NFTs, Omni offers the best NFT support any wallet has, so you can collect and manage your favorite NFTs across all chains in one place. Omni truly is the easiest way to use Web3 and it's fully custodial, meaning you never have to trust any one of your assets other than yourself, and they support Ledger. Give Omni a try at omni.app. So Paul, thanks for joining us uh, today. It's been a long time coming, and so uh, yeah, happy to have you here. I'm super excited to to join today. As I mentioned before, I've been you know listening for Epicenter for as long as I was into crypto. So very excited to be here today. Super nice. So how long exactly is that, Paul? Tell us about your your background and uh, what you were up to before Morpho. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, my journey in crypto began when I was in high school. Like basically. You know, it was pure technical interest into blockchain at first. So it was more into consensus algorithms and, and, and Bitcoin in, in 2015-16. I, I went into my studies, studied computer science and math, uh, did a lot of work into like blockchain technology and how those consensus algorithms could scale um, and ended up being interested specifically in Ethereum and more the you know, application layers, smart contracts, and, and then DeFi. And, and DeFi was really, to me, uh, it's such an, an interesting use case of blockchain technology that I, I could not do anything else but work into that space. So I just thought I'd, I'd, I'd put some research efforts there. And yeah, this is how, you know, step by step, I came to, to play around with protocols. And uh, I mean, play around theoretically, I mean, like <laughs> playing with the concepts of the protocol. I, I never really used DeFi uh, in, in, in my previous, you know, before going into Morpho. Uh, and, and then I, I started designing protocols like, like Morpho and, and came to do Morpho Labs to develop the Morpho protocol. So that's how I, I, I got into this, basically. How, how come you never used uh, DeFi beforehand, despite the fact uh, that you were quite knowledgeable about, uh, about it? So basically, what was missing for you to actually go, you know, head first into it? I think it was <laughs> as simple as gas costs. Uh, you know, at the time I was like, and I never invested in, in, in crypto uh, specifically because uh, I was too young to do so at the time. Like I, I, I did not pass my, my 18 years old. And 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 basically when I, I went into crypto, I, like I, I could see, you know, uh, all those curves uh, exploding, but I could not participate, which was quite frustrating. <laughs> Uh, but then when, when time come to play around with, with, with DeFi, uh, I was like, gas price was completely outbidding my, my, uh, student portfolio basically. <laughs> so that's probably the reason why. Um, but uh, you know, in practice, I was more interested in reading white papers and, and, you know, uh, trying to make sense of what, you know, Uniswap was doing and what, why it's different from, from traditional finance, what it brings. To traditional finance, what could it, you know, what value it could bring to the world in general? I think it's not a question we we ask sufficiently often, especially in DeFi. It's like, what what is the specific added value that we bring to the end user? Like, if DeFi scales to to mi billions of users, but yeah, I was it was more intellectual interest, I would say, uh, than you know, playing around. So I remember uh, when you guys were just getting started and you uh, you gave a talk at the Kiln office. I think it was probably one of the first talks you gave and, uh, ex you know, explaining the concept of Morpho. And, you know, one of the things that uh, I, I thought was just like wild about your, your story and the story of the team is that when Morpho launched, you guys were all still in school. 
Uh, and in fact, uh, I think the idea for Morpho uh, came from uh, one of your professors. Can you maybe just retell that story? And uh, yeah, how, how, did the, how did the idea come to be and that journey? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think, uh, so back in, I would say 2020, um, I had really two passions. Like the first one was blockchain technology and the second one was entrepreneurship. And so, you know, in entrepreneurship, we often tell you like, you have to get some sort of unfair advantage such that you have something that you that make you, you know, different from others and make you stand out. And this is how you, you become successful in entrepreneurship. And with that in mind, I, I really love blockchain. So it made sense to, to, to do blockchain stuff. And I decided to, so my goal at the time was pretty ambitious. It was like, I want to be the most knowledgeable entrepreneur about blockchain, about the technical specifics about blockchain in France. And so I decided to take every single course uh, on like theoretical course on blockchain and DeFi in Paris that existed. So I had like, you know, maybe 10 or, or 11 courses on top of my existing courses at university that I would take. And uh, I came to, to meet some of the best researchers in, in that space in, in, in Paris. And, uh, and together we formed the think tank. And in that think tank, we, we basically met every, you know, twice every, every week and basically, you know, just chat and discuss about mechanisms, what we can do better about them. And, and I would say like, Morpho is a, a construction, a collective construction of so many different ideas that all came together. Uh, and that the, the premise of it was during this think tank. And like, we had so many people saying, Hey, like, okay, compound is doing the things this way. Why not are they doing this this way? And what are the technical limitations to be able to have, you know, better 100% capital efficiency while still being liquid, this kind of questions. And uh, we ended up with the premise of Morpho. And then I said, okay, like, let, let's get serious about this. Co-founded Morpho Labs and, and really regrouped a, a team of uh, four co-founders that, as you mentioned, were students at the time, uh, which was uh, quite funny. But I mean, uh, somehow, you know, spending 10 years, 20 years in investment banks can sort of, you know, probably constrain your branch too much such that you would not think of, you know, doing things in DeFi the same way a student with no experience uh, in, in traditional finance. I mean, no professional experience uh, would do. But yeah, so this is how we started. And actually, until six months ago, uh, I was still going to school and I just finished my, my head of study internship a few, few, few months ago. And uh, I'm, I'm yet to get my diploma, by the way, but that's, <laughs> that's another story. Yeah, that's incredible. <laughs> and and uh, you guys, um, you know, I, I think what's also been really uh, interesting about your journey is that, um, that like you guys have built this protocol and you, uh, just a few months ago closed a very impressive funding round with some pretty top tier VCs. Um, how, how did that come to be and what was the what was the uh, the kind of journey to getting you know a6 CZ and all these uh, all these investors on board yeah I think it's a good question so maybe first just like to mention that it was during market conditions that were quite favorable of course it does not do everything but like that's probably not something that would be as easily doable. I don't mean it was easy, it was hard to do, but uh, it was maybe even harder in those market conditions, obviously. But basically, I mean, at the time, we just had the concepts, but it was such a zero to one in terms of mechanism design and in terms of like how the team internally at Morpho Labs is conceptualizing and thinking about DeFi is like, maybe we'll have the chance to talk about it, but it's radically different from what other protocols are doing in terms of you know lending but also in terms of dexes etc so we really wanted to be very very innovative and at the same time so we had very very innovative mechanisms and at the same time we had a product that made so much sense right so again we'll probably talk about it but it was a pure improvement of something that already had a huge market fit and probably the biggest market fit in, in whole DeFi at the time, which was basically collateralized lending on Aave and, and Compound. And Morpho is literally 
uh, like the pure improvements of that. And so this is where like, hey, like this thing is working. It has a huge market. This is Avin Compound. But Morpho is here. They have like fresh new concepts. They think about things differently. But on top of that, they provide a, a, a product that is same risk parameters, same liquidity, and has better rates. So that couldn't that could not fail. And uh, I mean, this is what they, they, they said to, to them when investing at least. Uh, but I think this is like pretty much the story. It was the rounds, the last round of funding that we did is mainly composed of American VCs, which I think is worth mentioning because uh, we struggled in Europe before being successful in the US. It's like the story somehow had more fit with the US VCs, like European VCs was like, were probably, you know, uh, maybe not as, as well as funded as the American ones, but I just thought it was interesting to see how of a gap there was between their reaction uh, in the US versus in, in, in Europe. Uh, so yeah, probably something, I don't know, some, some, some sort of fit. I, I, I don't really explain it to be honest. But. Cool. So we've talked a bit about um, the setting. Um, let's dig into the protocol. Um, maybe before we kind of uh, get into the weeds, in a nutshell, you already said that basically it's a it's a protocol that centers around um, lending and borrowing, and it strictly improves on compound and ARPA, or at least that's what you claim. Um, so can you um, talk about what the protocol does in a nutshell? Yeah, absolutely. So Morpho is a lending protocol. So basically you lend and borrow crypto assets uh, on Mofo, the same way you would do on Aave, Compound, Euler, whatever lending protocol, other collateralized lending protocol that exists in, in, in DeFi. So basically, when you're lending, there is a borrower that comes that puts some collateral to work and, and borrow your money. And it's a very low risk, low reward uh, profile because every loan that is taken is secured by some collateral. So in case the collateral cannot be you know, backing the fully the loan, then the liquidation happened. And so in every case, the lender should, uh, if liquidations are working well, uh, be able to have some sort of risk-free uh, yeah, uh, yields. And um, so in terms of product, this is what it is. And now what, what's different from Avin Compound is actually that Mofo is built on top of Avin Compound. So if you have Compound, you have an instance of Morpho called Morpho Compound that is working on top of Compound. Same thing for Aave. There is Aave protocol and there is Morpho Aave protocol that is built on top of, Morpho, of Aave. And basically, why is that so? Is because Morpho is going to optimize Aave and is going to optimize Compound. So the question is, what do we have to optimize? And if you go to Aave website or to Compound website, if you look at the rates, you, you, you quickly realize that you have a huge spread between the lending and the borrowing rates. It's like 1% to lend or 3% to borrow. Okay. And um, basically the reason why that spread is, is because those protocols, the way they work deeply needs to have a ton of idle liquidity in them that is not put to work. And that is going to induce the spread. So it's, it's let's say, capital inefficiency. We can dig into that maybe if, if necessary. But uh, without getting into the details, they have, you know, this is materialized by a spread, which Morpho is going to optimize by just taking the mid-rate, for example, and say, hey, instead of lending at one, using Morpho AV, you'll be lending at two. And instead of borrowing at three, you'll be borrowing at two on Morpho AV. So that's the overall concept. Uh, you get better rates on Aave than on, Mo on Morpho Aave than on Aave, and you preserve all the, the, the risk parameters that you had on Aave, so you get the same collateral factors and, and sort of these sort of things, and you get access to the same liquidity, which is like billions of dollars on, on, on Aave. How, how do you manage to actually get the APY um, down from the uh, borrow APY from Compound and up from the uh, Lend APY from Compound? Yes, that's a good question. So in order to understand that, we have to explain how the mechanism works in, in, in Aave. So basically on Aave or Compound, basically let's set a pool because they're working very, very similarly. Um, you, you have 
basically many lenders all supplying to the same pool of capital and you have very few borrowers and those borrowers are paying three and those lenders are earning one and the reason why that is is because the numerous lenders are going to share the earnings generated by the few borrowers so the three is going to be divided into multiple ones given across all the pool so you know, yields generated by borrowers is diluted across all the pool. And so the reason why MOFO is more capital efficient is basically saying, hey, you are a lending pool user. You are borrowing from, from, from Aave, for example, or you're lending from Aave. Well, basically, you could be lending and borrowing at two. Like, I mean, the concept is simple. Like, I'm, I'm lending at 2%. Someone theoretically could take my my loan, uh, my my deposit for for two percent of a borrowing API, and this is what Mofo does. Mofo is building a peer-to-peer -peer matching engine that is built on top of the lending pool that enables lending pool users to be matched peer-to-peer -peer whenever there is an opportunity to increase their rates if they're a lender or to decrease their rates if they're a borrower. So it's a small improvement. It represents basically. What it means is instead of having a, a, a diluted share of their capital that is put to work, they get all their capital that is put to work, which results in an increase of like plus 0 0.5, plus 1% APY, uh, which is reasonable in, in those market conditions, to be honest. How have people dealt with this spread before Morpho? Was, were there any other solutions or like other attempts to try to... Um reduce this spread? I mean, you guys are doing it by matching borrowers and lenders directly in a sort of peer-to-peer -peer way. Are there other uh, approaches that one can uh, can implement here to, to have a better um, efficiency of capital when, when doing lending? Yeah, absolutely. There's many different ways that could work. Uh, we went for a very specific implementation. Um, for one of the reasons why nobody went for something, I would say, more for similar is because actually the spread was hidden by liquidity mining. So as of context, in, in 2020, 21, 22, lending protocols spent a lot of money distributing tokens to their users. And you had a 1% you know, USDC APY, a 3% borrowing APY in USDC, but on each side of the market, you would get distributed 2%, in which case you'd get a much better API. And this spread, I would say, virtually or artificially is disappearing. And probably the reason why no one came you know, for a solution like Mofo before is because they were doubtful about the fact that rewards was ever going to stop a day or not. And, and we really started the innovation of, of, of Mofo by betting that you know, rewards are we're not going to stand like forever, right? So it's just basically protocols are, are losing money emitting rewards, so so they could not do that forever, which they stopped pretty much the the day we we launched uh, we, we launched Morpho. So so that would be one of the reasons why. Uh, second reason why would probably be the complexity of it. It's not so easy to do. Obviously, but does not mean like no, no one would have ever done it, especially if we we managed to do it, to do it. But yeah, I would say those are the two biggest friction to actually make it. Okay, so um, I kind of I I want to talk about how it works on a nitty gritty level before I go to like the economics of it. Does it work for you, Paul? Absolutely. Fantastic. So let's talk about the matching engine. So basically, say I uh, want to post a position to lend some. Capital. What do I do? Do I post a message, or do I already? I mean, do I have to pay gas for my transaction? Yes, absolutely. So the matching engine is fully on chain. So basically, Mofo is a smart contract. It's it's completely on chain, and it's a smart contract plugged on top of Aave or Compound. Uh, where users, instead of interacting with Aave directly and using the supply, borrow, withdraw, repay functions of, of the pool, they would be using the supply, borrow, withdraw, repay functions of, of Morpho. And then Morpho is going to, let's say as a lender, let's say I'm the very first person to lend on, on Morpho, I'm going to deposit 100 DAI, I'm going to be put in a list, okay, or any kind of data structure. And my liquidity is going to be put on the pool. 
So I'm yielding at 1%, which is the APY of the pool. And there is no counterparty to match me. So basically, like there is, uh, uh, I, I, there was no other way, just Morpho puts, puts you in, into the pool, but you, you are in the list. And, and now a borrower comes in. And when the borrower comes in, uh, he's going to say, hey, I, I, I want to borrow one. So he deposits some ETH as collateral, and he's going to borrow 100 DAI. And Morpho is going to look into this data structure. So let's say it's a queue to simplify. And they say, OK, the first member of that queue, he's posting liquidity on, on Aave. Let's withdraw this liquidity from Aave in order to give it directly to the borrower. And this is how you know, broadly the matching engine works. OK, so um, when I post something to the queue, um, it's immediately matched against our compound. Um, and if there's a counterparty within Morpho, um, I am matched against the counterparty and basically the over collateralization of the lending pool on our compound that kind of results in the, um, in the yield being split several ways between different lenders goes to the sole lender that is now matched peer to peer. Is that kind of a, a good summary? Yes, I think it's, 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 it's a nice way to, to think about it. Yes. How do you, how do you stop people from um, submitting lots of small orders that the borrower will then have to pay gas for matching? Yes, that's an excellent question. And that's actually the reason why you can't do for uh, a first in first out model, as I was describing. And actually, you have different ways you can solve the problem. Um, one way would be, OK, let's just do a pool inside a pool. And this way, you don't need any queue. And it's just you know a pool with a higher utilization of the capital. And so but that works. But at the same time, for different reasons, it's not optimal in terms of capital efficiency. Uh, so. The queue does not work because basically someone can, as you mentioned, supply one cent like 1,000 times and basically DDoS the, uh, the matching engine. So you have to come up with different ideas. Uh, one of the most simple ones, and this is the one that we, we started with, is basically to sort a, a part of the list. So in a blockchain environment, you have a limited complexity that you have available in order to do operations. Otherwise, gas would basically explode. And so we came up with what we call a semi-sorted list, where basically it's trivial. We just have a, a heap, so basically a data structure uh, that is able to get us the, the biggest users across like the uh, top 10. And then the rest is a FIFO. So basically, when I loop into the matching engine, I'll get to, you know, if I'm borrowing, I'll be matched first with the biggest lender, second with the second biggest lender, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm sure that I'm going to get liquidity out of it and I won't be DDoS. And then I went, I go into the FIFO. And so this is kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, the simplest implementation and that, uh, you know, solve the specification of the problem that we were given in the first place. And this is the one we decided to, to, to implement. Uh, but yes, yeah, there's other more complex and interesting way to solve the problem uh, that we've been working on as well. OK, so basically, uh, larger lenders at lower rates are prioritized, if I understand um, correctly. Um, and then basically, my question uh, kind of that follows from that, if there later comes a better lender or borrower to the to Morpho, is everything else reshuffled? No, it is not. In the current implementation of Morpho, it is not. So basically, if you get matched, no one can unmatch you, even though they propose a better rate, for example. Actually, in Morpho, you can't really propose a rate. There is one peer-to-peer -peer API for everybody, but you can, you know, this is a limit of the design, right? It, it would be better, of course, if everybody was able to, you know, be more competitive about their rates. And every time I repropose something uh, that is better, everything gets reshuffled such that the market is more efficient. But the limit here and the reason why we decided not to go for this kind of solution is simply gas costs. It's like doing it on layer one, 
uh, maybe it's doable on, on other chains or, or on layer two, like like Nessus chain or, or or you know zk sync or, or this kind of things. But on layer one, it's it's very hard to you know come up with a uh, I would say constant time algorithm that do all those kind of matching in peer to peer. Uh, so that was probably the reason why we uh, we decided not to have this reshuffling mechanism, even though it's a it's a good improvement to have, obviously, if you don't take gas costs into consideration. Hmm. So when you um, when you uh, lend in a, a traditional like Aave or Compound, um, your liquidity is being posted up to and it's basically collateralizing. Uh, all of the loans that that are that are being taken out by borrowers, as you said earlier, there is uh, so much more liquidity that is covering. So it's it's capital inefficient. But that means that as a as a borrower, I can come in and out of that market, uh, and and I I can sort of always be borrowing assets um, across this pool of collateral. What what happens as so as a lender? If I'm matched with a borrower and now that borrower wants to take their collateral out, how is my loan now being collateralized, uh, knowing that it's this like peer to peer thing rather than borrowing against this massive pool of collateral? Yeah, that's uh, an excellent question. And that's probably the first cornerstone to the, the MOFA protocol and how all this mechanism, you know, unwrap. So I'm going to attempt this as simply as possible. Please, you know, feel free to ask me intermediate questions if you if you need. But basically, let's get the intuition for an example first. So if we come back to this example where Alice was providing 100 die and Bob provided one ETH in order to borrow 100 die on Morpho. Basically, what's happening here is that Alice uh, her 100 die is going to get into the pockets of Bob, and Bob can basically, you know, since the the, the all the collateral is much peer to peer, Bob can just, you know, turn off his his machine, go offline, and do whatever he wants with with the 100 die. And at this point in time, let's say Alice is alone, there is no die. Like uh, Morpho has access to no die, so how could she be, you know, able to withdraw? And and this is what Morpho solves. It's like, how do you have 100% capital efficiency without, you know, uh, while staying liquid? And so what, what happens here when Alice is going to click the withdraw button is the following. So Alice triggers the withdraw function and Morpho is going first to unmatch Alice and Bob. Say, okay, Alice and Bob are not even are not matched anymore because Alice is about to withdraw. So Morpho needs to reconnect Bob with someone, and Bob is going to be reconnected with the pool itself. So what's happening here is that Morpho is going to take a loan of 100 die on the pool with the ETH of Bob and give that 100 die to Alice such that Alice can withdraw at any time. So basically, yes, we have 100% capital efficiency. Uh, there is no die, but since the borrower that is, you know, taking all the die has put some collateral, then this collateral can be used to be actually uh, borrowing on compounds and and match the position such that Alice can withdraw at any time. I hope that was clear. I can go into you know different explanations of that. If so, so basically, then what's happening is that compound or Ave. Is acting as a, a backup mechanism, in order, and so you fall back to you fall back to compounder Ave rates if there is no uh, lender, or sorry, if there's no yeah, if there's no lender uh, to back your position. Exactly. Yeah, I think it's it's interesting, and maybe I did not mention sufficiently clearly in the beginning. It's important to mention that. Morpho not always offers the peer to peer API, which is in in the middle. It offers the peer-to-peer -peer API if a match is found from the borrower and the lender side. And if if a counterparty, a counterparty leaves or if there is no counterparty available, then there is a fallback to the underlying pool. So basically, in terms of products, it's a lending protocol that provides the same risk parameters, the same liquidity, and at least the same rates as Aave, right? Worst case scenario, you get the Aave yields from a borrower or from a lender perspective. 
And in average, you'll be much peer-to-peer and enjoy a better rate. So if you look at um, Arven compound, the reason um, why um, the borrow and lend APYs are different from one another is to ensure there is sufficient exit liquidity, right? Because basically the user experience, if you want to withdraw your funds from a pool and you can't because it's still borrowed and you can't force repayment unless it's unless uh, the loan is underwater, um, you can't withdraw your funds. And basically what will happen then is that the rates are adjusted until it is economically um, unviable to kind of keep uh, paying the interest on those loans and so on, but it's 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 a we, it's a bad situation for the lender because you're under the impression that in principle you can um, exit at any time, and that's why that's why uh, the, the rates are so different because basically they have to make the pool bigger so that basically in like ninety nine point five percent of uh, cases, uh, everyone who wants to exit can exit the pool. Um, as Morpho, you're kind of piggybacking off of that m- mechanism. So basically, you're using the Arve and compound exit liquidity um, and kind of take the most um, lucrative uh, deals, the lend and borrow deals of large um, f- of large lenders and borrowers, because those are prioritized of large lenders um, uh, and kind of skim that off the top. So um, I assume I assume you guys uh, are in contact with Arben Compound. How do they feel about this? Yes, I think it's a, it's an excellent question. And uh, this is the question I get asked all the time is, uh, I mean, this is true that uh, MoFo, the way it's designed, is taking volume from Aave and, and from Compound on the borrowing and, and the lending side. And uh, Morpho is, you know, it's it's a bit of a weird relationship because it's uh, a bit competitive in the sense that we're taking market shares. But on the other end, uh, Morpho is, you know, uh, bringing new rates. I mean, rates that are not artificial, like actual efficiency, uh, that is enabled into DeFi rates that were not possible before. And so this is interesting because uh, basically we're unlocking new use cases, new usage, where basically lenders would not come at 1%, but they would come at 2 And thanks to Morpho, they're now coming. And and Aave is getting the uh, a little bit of uh, a share of that through the fallback borrowing volume or the fallback lending volume. And if you look at Compound, for example, I don't know if that's still the case, but uh, at least uh, for many months this year, Morpho was the biggest borrower of Compound. And that's very interesting because actually Compound does not have so many organic borrowers. When you look at this, the, the data of Compound, most borrowers on Compound, which is the most important thing for Compound because they, they bring the money in, is actually artificial borrowers farming comp rewards most of the time. Not always, but most of the time. And so Morpho... Uh, actually appeared to be the biggest borrower to the biggest money bringer to the to the compound protocol so you know i i, I don't want to hide the fact that morpho is competitive it is to some extent but it's also growing the pie for everybody and i think like roberts from from compounds and and stanny from from ave got this right and uh you know i had the chance to to, to talk to roberts uh, like to DM him uh, about this a few times, and I think you know he and he, he and, and Stanley uh, express uh, sometimes uh, themselves about it uh, very briefly. But I think this is a, the right way to think about it. Uh, I, I hope that was clear as a as an explanation. Yeah, that's clear. Do you have any um, actual data about how many of um, the uh, the users, your vampire attacking away from compound and oven, how many you're actually organically bringing to the table? I, I, I never fetched the data, but I, I should definitely. I think that's interesting. And I think, you know, the market will decide in the end. And in any case, Morpho is inevitable. So we'll have to deal with it anyway, whatever the result is. We've kind of glossed over the fact that in matching borrowers to lenders directly, you're also taking 
rewards from the pool. So basically, not only are you taking share, but you're also making the rewards on the pool smaller than they otherwise would be, right? Yeah, so maybe you can add a little bit of, of, of reflection on that is um, users. So first, more for if a user is put on the pool, if no counterparties match, then the user is put on the pool and is earning rewards. Morpho is not taking any cuts on that and is just giving it back to the user. And uh, and so so Morpho will just give the comp rewards to to the to the lender or the borrower that did not find a match. If the user is matched, then the user is out of compound and experiencing a better rate, a better native rate, like in native, you know, in ETH, for example. And in which case, the lender or the borrower is actually removed from the pool so there's more rewards remaining for the rest of the pool i don't know if that's clear well yes but the it, they're, they're removed from the pool because 100 percent of the 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 money they're lending is borrowed so basically if that were to be i mean i mean th this is i don't think this computes what do you mean no i i think so there is a borrow coming so and extracting a lender or the opposite from the pool in which case those users that were previously earning rewards are not earning rewards anymore. And Morphos are not earning the comp rewards if they're a match pure. I, I, I totally understand that part. But um, so basically, to me, the question is the borrower that comes in anew, um, would that borrower otherwise have gone to Avo or Compound um, or would they have just refrained from taking a loan? So basically, if they had refrained from taking a loan, I totally get your line of argument. But basically, I'm skeptical um, that people who actually come to Morpho wouldn't otherwise have defaulted to going to Aave or Compound. Oh, yeah, I, I think like uh, you're right. Like it, it depends on the use case. Like there are some places where you only want to edge yourself or to borrow if the rate is lower. And in some cases where you would have gone anyway to Aave because like whatever the race you, you want to borrow and in which case you go to Morpho, in which case this is the vampire side of things. But there is a not vampire side of things where uh, you can only offer it to borrow at 1% or you just have a use case at 1%, in which case you come to, uh, to Morpho and there is the fallback of that. Uh, if there is no match that is found or only a part of the match that is found that is fall back into to Aave for the borrowing side. Sure, absolutely. If you're priced out, you're priced out. I, to I totally get that. Um, let, let's, let's talk about um, the preferential treatment of um, larger uh, lenders, right? So basically on Compound and Aave, everyone kind of um, gets the same rewards in proportion to how, how much uh, money they put up. Whereas... Um, for 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 uh, Morpho, whales are matched first because of you know gas efficiencies because everything is um, on chain. It's and it's not uh, it's not a pool mechanism. Um, what what happens to small lenders? Uh, is it even is it even feasible or attractive for them to actually come to Morpho? Yes, that's the next in question. So maybe first something that I want to underline is that. It's a default, like it, 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 it's, a, it's a default of the mechanism that we had to sort users. It's because we, have, we were so constrained uh, about Ethereum that we had to sort a part of the user. But, you know, ideally, we would not want any prefer preferential treatment on, on the size of the nodes. Now, this is solved uh, by having uh, small lenders regrouping together in a single smart contract, which happens usually, like, usually, you know, end users are not interacting with Morpho. They are interacting with protocols that are themselves interacting with Morpho, in which, in which case they ha can have like, you know, a uh, bigger size and have more chances to be matched altogether. So that's one thing. And uh, yeah, I, I don't want to tease too much about what we're doing, but uh, like the problem is solvable. Okay. And what happens if um, someone from this larger... Um, this this kind of this uh, pool of people who kind of just got together to kind of co-invest in Morpho. Oh, um, what happens if one of them wants out? H how do you get them out? Oh, you, you, basically one lender. Uh, so to the eyes of Morpho, this vault uh, is just a normal user. 
And so they can withdraw a share of like on Morpho, you can withdraw a share of what you have. So basically, okay, you can, you can do a fractional withdraw. Yes. Oh, okay, good. Cool. That's super good. Um, so when uh, when you guys take a, a borrow position on Ave or Compound, like you mentioned earlier, that you were one of the largest borrowers on on, on Compound, um, you're you're earning. Uh, uh, compound like comp rewards for that. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what those tokens are used for? And I think like more broadly, I'd like to understand the tokenomics of Morpho because as a Morpho uh, user, you're also earning more Morpho tokens. And so what's the interplay here between that and, you know, broader uh, tokenomics and how they work? Yeah, I think we're very like minimalist in terms of token design and what we want to achieve uh, with the token. Like we really want to, you know, every proposal that we're going to make on the DAO to have an evolution of the token is, is, is going to be very minimalist. And we, we want that every step that we take makes sense is actually useful for the protocol and its users. So coming back to your question is the comp tokens are all redistributed to uh, compound uh, to the Morpho compound users. So if I'm lending and my position somehow, you know, abstractly is, is ended up on the pool, then I'm earning those rewards and Morph is going to account for those and is going to give them back to you. So there is no cut or whatsoever that is taken by Morph. Like this is not the idea. And so that's one thing. Uh, then this, 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 uh, the second thing about the Morph tokens is that on top of that, whether you're match, whether you're not match, you'll always get Morph tokens. Uh, distributed to to your line and, 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 and borrow positions. And those tokens are not transferable uh, for the moment at least. And basically the idea here and the motivation is is not you know to increase the APY. I'm a firm non-believer on yield powered by by governance tokens. However it's here to decentralize the protocol. Like in my opinion it makes sense to have DAOs and protocols governed by investors, contributors, and users. Like it's, uh, in my opinion, a good equilibrium to have the three of those that can have a say in, in the governance in the long term. So that was important to us to, you know, uh, kickstart in some way, some sort of uh, liquidity mining program uh, as it is done on, on Morpho. And there is also this good effect of bootstrapping, right? So in, in, in the, the very, you know, the, the first millions that we had, I think Morpho now is, almost at half a billion. Uh, but the first millions that we had was like 100% of it, not 100%, but like maybe 99% of it was analyzed. Like we interpreted it as liquidity mining, right? Which is not the case now. It's like, because we had fair volumes, we were able to, you know, uh, discuss more integrations. And I think this is the way tokens should be used. I want to talk about the governance um, in a little bit of uh, Morpho DAO. I have one last question for the protocol. Uh, sorry to kind of uh, dig dig deep here. So um, obviously a core cool part of um, a lending protocols is uh, liquidation. So if a position is underwater um, and a borrower is matched with a lender, um, typically you could anyone can kind of liquidate that position and uh, and take a cut off um, uh, of the collateral. Um, so I mean, I assume I, I think it's exactly the same on Morpho, but obviously sometimes it goes wrong. So basically sometimes there's, I mean, there's still some risk involved. So sometimes prices crash too fast or no one actually liquidates because gas costs are too high or something. And um, on compound and other, obviously this is a communalized risk because basically this is just a, a un, unrepaid debt from, from the pool. So basically this uh, loss gets redistributed to all uh, lenders. Um, what happens on Morpho if a um, if there's a liquidation failure? It, it does the person who's matched with the person uh, with um, the borrower that uh, um, has that mishap happen um, actually, you know, do, do they end up empty-handed? Yeah, that's that's an excellent question. Uh, so we often say peer-to-peer -peer matching because it helps conceptualize the mechanism of Morpho. But in Morpho, actually, you never matched with a, a single counterparty. 
It's just the state. It's like I'm in a peer-to-peer -peer enhanced state or I'm not in a peer-to-peer -peer enhanced state. And so there is, it feels like, okay, there is one counterparty which I'm bearing the risk of, uh, but this is not the case. Like the way it works is like when you have your money that is put in the pool, then you bear the risk of bad debt on the, the, the pool. Okay, so if I've incurred some bad debt, you're also incurred some bad debt. If your, your position is matched peer to peer, you have a uh, shared loss. So first, uh, something that I want to mention is that uh, you have the same collateral factors, the same oracles, et cetera, as on Aave. So there is no specific parameter that would, you know, uh, but yeah, I think that's important to mention. But now if we put in the scenario where for some reason liquidators are not able to liquidate, then the loss is shared across all more for users. Okay. So it's not specific to one counterparty, but it's a smaller subset as the other protocol. Is that, does that answer the question? Yeah, that answers the question uh, perfectly. So kind of it's like a gated community within the exactly. within the uh, within the Ava. Okay. Um, yeah. No, I I think I understand that. I think this also solves a question that I had on the regulatory side because basically the reason why um, protocols like Ava and Compound are huge, largely unregulated is because you always just deal with a smart contract. Whereas if you have a direct counterparty. Um, this kind of um, this kind of preferential treatment usually goes away in most jurisdictions. So, kind of actually matching people peer to peer also comes with um, legal downsides. Yes, absolutely, and uh, I think this is why you know they they really hate to talk about lending protocol, and 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 they prefer talking about you know liquidity pools or you know you don't lend you supply liquidity or you deposit liquidity. Uh, but yeah, here it's a peer-to-peer -peer state, but at the same time, I want people to understand. So I, I say peer-to-peer -peer matching, but, but yeah, that's, uh, it's clearly a mutualized state. Yeah. I'd like to jump to, to using the product, uh, because I, um, you know, yeah, yeah, like yesterday I, uh, you know, looked at my Instadap and I was like, oh, hey, my, my Ave positions are not yet on Morpho and. And uh, you know maybe I should just move them over there and benefit from better um, better rates. Um, so, what one question I had was when you're using Morpho, are like when you say that you use this this uh, phrasing of like um, enhanced uh, like an enhanced position where you're where you basically like it, you know Morpho. I feel it's sort of like this progressive enhancement of like a lending pool to uh, a peer to peer, but you always fall back. As a user, is it made obvious that your lending position is um, either um, matched on Morpho or uh, or you've fallen back to Compound? Is that like clear to the user and also the rate that you're getting? Yes, it's it's a uh, uh, it's a good question. I think it's hard to uh, have a good user experience with such a complex, you know, uh, <laughs> mechanism. I would say, uh, but. Basically, on Compound and Aave, you have those C tokens that are basically not so useful except for user experience. Like there's no technical interest in having a C token or A token. So it's just a representation of something. Yet, when you have A tokens, you you see the token yields like in your portfolio. You you know how much it's worth, and it's you know a, a very you user friendly uh, behavior. On Morpho, not all positions are treated equally. And because of that, you don't have like a a, a DRC twenty, for example. You you could have in some world some sort of NFT, but we did think that that was an even worse user experience to have an NFT, and that people might throw it out, you know, not knowing what it was. So we're like, okay, maybe that's not a, a good way to go. And um, and so basically, this is a work the front end has to do. Uh, so when you go to InstaDAP, for example, they do it extremely well. Uh, you they tell you like what is your average, and if you go to Morpho's like uh, interface as well, as well the one developed by Morpho Labs, the one developed by Mutative Team. Like we have uh, many many different front ends, and usually what they're gonna do is gonna say, hey, you have 100 in peer to peer, 100 
in in pool okay so it's like half half so we're going to make an average of your of your rates and such that the user does not feel the complexity okay does that, does that make sense yeah so your position can be half or, or there could be one proportion of your uh, portion of your position that's uh backed by like a peer to peer loan on mofo and the other uh would be backed by uh, some um, some position on compound or are they exactly yeah and and it's the work of the front end to average that and make it similar such that you have an average API and why is it that there are like two separate like morpho compound and morpho ave why uh, wouldn't you just be utilizing the liquidity in both of those pools and sort of finding ways to optimize like so basically like finding the better rate uh, depending on the assets you're borrowing against uh, for the user and sort of just, you, you know, adding you know, the ability to add any sort of liquidity um, pool underlying like one Morpho interface or a contract. I think two reasons. The first one is complexity. Many, many protocols have tried, you know, aggregating uh, lending protocols and they mostly all have failed to some extent and and probably the reason why is because they have, not every protocol share the same risk and they're not the same in the sense that they take different collateral factors approaches so it's easier for the lending side of things you can say hey like uh we will select the 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 pool with the the more interesting api but if you start also aggregating borrow positions at the same time, then it becomes you know a bit hard because you have to decide on risk. It's like you have to decide which collateral factor I'm going to use. Like, am I going to use the collateral factor of Aave or of Compound or the most conservative of the two? And as soon as you say I'm going to use the most conservative of the two, you're not an improvement anymore. You're just a different product. And so, in terms of product decision, it was it was basically a product decision that I took was okay. I want to be an improvement of something. I, I, I want to be able to, 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 to improve something that I know for sure uh, has a market. And so that's why we, we decided to separate in order to have like no trade-off. However, like there's definitely room for, for you know, more complex mechanisms where you could aggregate those different protocols in a more advanced way, I would say. Mm. Okay, so there's there's like a lot of complexity in aggregating different liquidity pools that that doesn't exist, say, with like aggregating, you know, like you, there's so many DeFi yield, like a DeFi DEX aggregators that, uh, and that thing, uh, that problem has been like mostly solved, I think. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think it's it's a matter of you know risk reward um, rather than just rewards, uh, and so it's for that reason it's it's an additional dimension and you have to take into account in the aggregation process. And then Compound and Aave were not made to, to, to share the liquidity with a partner. So uh, when you can borrow on the one, you can borrow on the other. So it's, it's very hard to have this sort of aggregated. It's, it's visible, but it, it's, it's complex. So we thought like as a first step, you know, our first protocol should be something fairly simple. This is why the matching engine has a lot of room for improvement. This is why uh, we're not aggregating, but maybe in, in the future we'll be able to release more more advanced versions. I under, I totally understand where you're coming from, and bas basically, as a DeFi user, you kind of you want to be very specific about which protocols you're fine with. Um, so basically, at least you'd actually have to disclose to the user um, which protocols you kind of mix by default and have to have have them. Uh, allow them to opt out of that and so on so i actually do think that especially since everything is on chain this is probably too much overhead for not um all that much reward yeah definitely i, I think there's room for you know actual DeFi middlewares like you know yearn finance pool finance etc to actually you know mix at least the, the lending side of things and mix different strategies or rebalance and stuff like that but this is like a different user kind. We really want it to be as low level as possible and just be, you know, as close to a primitive as we could be. And yeah, that's probably the reason why we, we went that route. You also get natural rebalancing anyways, right? So basically it's not like no one's making the markets. It's, I mean, there's t tons of bots out there that kind of try to get uh, the yields to uh, commensurate numbers. Yeah, exactly. And actually, 
maybe one one last thing to mention about that topic because I think it's interesting is uh, rates are not so well arbitraged, and the reason why they're not arbitraged is that because uh, it's not because bots are lazy or bots have not been coded. Bots have been coded. It's just that they don't have the same appreciation of risk on every single protocol, and that you ha you have a premium in like you know the reputation of a protocol, etc. And this is like so complex to factor in a smart contract, obviously. What's talk about the integration? So we already talked about Instadap uh, that was announced uh, like last year, um, and what's cool about that is that if you have like an Ave position, you you essentially don't have to unwind that position. You can just have it uh, be refinanced by Morpho. I haven't done that yet, but I, I think I'm I think I'm going to hit the button on that pretty soon. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, what what other uh, integrations? Um, uh, do you have to like improve the usability uh, and, and sort of like uh, pe people's ability to use Morpho? Yeah, I, I, I think we have a bunch. Like uh, we are talking to, you know, you have two kind of integrations like protocol integrations and, you know, more data analytics integration. So we're talking to a bunch of websites to get Morpho in approximately everywhere. Uh, and you have a lot of uh, funds as well integrating with Morpho and doing their complex quant stuff like uh, hedging and, and stuff like that. But uh, we have as well protocols like uh, Vault stablecoin or Origin US dollar stablecoin that are using their, their collateral and they put their collateral to work on the Morpho protocol. And they say, hey, like uh, we want better yield for our stablecoin users or saving rate or whatever. We are going to use. Um, we're going to use uh, this, and so yes, we have like for example DeFi hedge that can help you, you know, hedge your positions automatically uh, when you're managing Uniswap B3 positions. Uh, we have Spool that I was mentioning a bit uh, before, which enables you to diversify your your, your DeFi portfolio. Uh, we, we we really have a bunch of those, and and many coming in the pipeline as well, uh, but. You know, to be fair, and I think that's a, a good ending note as well, is that I, I, f I feel like there is a ceiling to that growth as well. It's like, okay, we're, we're like, I think we're top free lending protocol at the moment with like 500 million or close to 500 million in deposits uh, on Ethereum. Uh, but um, I, I do feel like, you know, those are just DeFi integrations for DeFi things that are often powered by DeFi tokens. And I feel like there's a lack of, you know, actual real world connected use case in all this. And I think that's going to be a challenge for us to reconnect somehow more for to this real usage and, you know, take DeFi to the next level. Cool. So let's kind of shift gears a little bit and talk about the Morpho business model. How do you guys make money, you know, other than raising money from American VCs? <laughs> that's that's a, a good way <laughs> but uh, no i of course joking here so morpho labs is um is a software and development company uh making money by doing contributions to dao uh and so ideally like the ideal you know way of, of making money for us is uh, basically proposing things to the Morpho DAO that are going to, you know, be approved, hopefully, and that we are paid by the DAO uh, to produce this research and enhance the protocol, the same way Aave Companies is doing it, the same way BGD Labs is doing it for Aave, for example. That raises the question of how Morpho makes money. <laughs> and so yes. uh, the answer is uh, Morpho in its current form is able to take a cut on the improvement that is made from Aave or from Compound. So it's basically, you're making 1% APY on, on, on Aave, 1.5 1, 1 on, on Morpho Aave, then Morpho is able to take, let's say, 20% of that improvement and taking 0.1% of the volume that is matched. So it's just a cut of the improvements. There is nothing like that is actually lost. And this is theoretical, so it's implemented, but it's not turned on. So currently the protocol is not making money. So how, I mean, basically if it's just a fee that's turned on, um, 
how do you guard yourselves against me just, you know, taking your code and forking it and kind of uh, uh, lowering that to 0.1 percent? And how do, how how do you make sure this there's actual um, uh, there's actual structural um, value in the protocol itself in the user base, and this doesn't actually end in a race to the bottom? Yeah, that's a, an excellent question that I think every DeFi contributor should reason about in some way or another. Um, so you have different ways to, to make this happen. Uh, one obvious way is to have a, a BUSL license, which is the case of Avi v free Compound v free and Uniswap v free um, This is not the case of Morpho. Morpho is GPL, copyleft license. So you can you can fork it if, if you wish to do it. And basically, the reason why uh, I think uh, we wanted to go that route is we believe in, as system grow more and more complex, we believe in network effects, you know, being able to retain users, even if it's at the cost of like a 0.1% fee. Uh, and the reason why that is especially true for complex systems is that uh, security and, you know, the trust in the DAO and the contributors themselves can be valuable for users. Like, okay, there is a brand behind it. And when you look at landing rates, it's actually interesting to see that, for example, Aave is capturing a ton of the landing volume, even though they're not offering, you know, as beneficial rewards as, as Compound, for example. And some analyze it. I'm not saying this is what's happening, but I'm, I'm just saying that some analyze it as basically the network effect of Aave, where people trust more Aave, the brand, and everything. And so you have you know, quantitative questions here is that how much does that represent in practice and how much like uh, this network effect is going to retain value and how, how big the fee could, uh, could be, et cetera. But I think you know, in the end, uh, we have not built something that is yet to revolutionize the world and this that is legitimate in uh really extracting a lot of value out of it i think the current thinking is for us yes uh live thanks to uh fundraising not turning on a fee because there is legal also legal you know considerations on that and work as much as possible to build something that has you know even greater traction and where it's actually you know worth taking a greater traction and also greater network effect so i think we, we're not we're we're more thinking about you know uh, uh, designing things that you know we're able to get a sufficient traction such that we feel legitimate to turn on a fee i uh, actually to propose to turn on the fee but i think that's not even the case at, at the moment i hope it answers uh, I went a bit far, but <laughs> hope it answers the question, uh, the initial question at least. No, no, it answers the question. So I, actually, I also see the stickiness of of um, DeFi applications. I think it's um, uh, it's a really difficult topic. Um, so what actually makes something sticky? Clearly, it's not just the best price or the best security. It's kind of like it's a user behavior question, uh, and it's not hundred percent clear to me what exactly actually entails the stickiness. Um, yeah. I, th I think there's a lot of, you know, it all comes back to trust at some point, which is a bit weird, but <laughs> that's how it is. And I, I do think it, the, the example of Compound and Aave is, is a good example. Like I literally talking to users, I literally had many calls with people saying, hey, I'm never going to put a penny on Compound. And I'm like, okay, I mean, Compound has been here for, for a long time, but, and, and you know, it's it's the network effect here is 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 really playing a role. I think it is is major in terms of uh, you know uh, how to retain users. And also there are some products where by design, because you have more volume, your product is working better. It's a bit just the case of Curve in that case. So tell us about the roadmap and uh, what's uh, coming for Morpho, I know that a lot of this is governed through governance, but uh, what are you most excited about? Yes, I think like, you know, uh, everything that will will be decided will be decided through governance and will be and will be voted, et cetera. Uh, when it comes to Morpho Labs and the research that we're doing on lending in general, uh, I would say like, uh, we've been thinking a lot about what makes sense, what does not make sense in, 
in decentralized lending. And I'm, I'm going to disappoint you a little bit, but as of now, we prefer, you know, uh, keeping things close to the chest for the moment in the sense that we really like to release things that we, we are very sure that they are very neat and clean, at least scientifically. Uh, so we'd, we'd rather, you know, not tease anything for six months and then release a big paper that we've been working on for more than a year uh rather than you know try to figure out roadmaps etc because like the, it's a constantly evolving space so I'm, I'm quite doubtful about roadmaps in 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 general i think you know we are a team of 20 a bit more than 20 we're mostly researchers so what we're doing is is research and what i can say though is that so far we have not something sufficiently clean and 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 that we're convinced of to 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 tease or release anything in the public. And also I have uh, uh, all, all the team of researchers that that are really, you know, firmly against the fact that we should tease these kind of things because for them it's science and that we should not be teasing science. And I respect that a lot. So I, I, I comply to, to the standards of, of the company and I, uh, and I just don't tease things. Okay, then maybe let me kind of zoom out a bit. Um, what are your personal hopes for the ecosystem for 2023? So my personal hopes are rationalizing. So a, a lot more DeFi. I think 2022 and the events, you know, are grim. And you know, I, obviously, I, I don't wish this would have happened uh, to a lot of people that suffered from it. But on the other hand, it's it has good aspects in the sense that. Uh, we are rationalizing the mechanisms we're designing. I think a lot of time has been lost in token design, uh, while we should have focused on mechanism design, for example. That's a personal take, not the, the take of Morph Labs, but I think like, uh, you know, it's we've seen mechanisms that are impressively relying on token incentives that inherently do not create value. And I'm hoping that 2023 is going to once and for all, you know, at least largely diminish the impact of those uh, those those mechanisms in, 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 in the space and how, you know, how talents are sometimes, you know, working on those designs while they could be working on, on, on more, some, some, you know, more interesting primitives, for example. Uh, so I think this is my first hope. Uh, I also think that this is the perfect year for building. Uh, I'm, I'm very excited about what's going on. Like I talk to teams uh, and they're all building something very exciting. Like I'm, I'm really excited to see like the the different announcements on Twitter that are going to be made in the next few months. Uh, and I would say my last hope is that we uh, regulations do not take you know too fast decisions on on the topic of DeFi. I think one very important key thing for for 2023 is that they they take the stance of you know regulating apps rather than protocols. It's it's a very deep, you know. Uh, I think this is the way they, sh they should behave, and if, if if they don't, again, personal take, but if they don't, I feel like uh, this could endanger largely the system. And finally, I hope for more institutional, you know, starting playing around DeFi. This does not like uh, a good start for 2023 because, like with the FTX events and everything, people do not feel, you know, inclined to get into DeFi again uh, any soon. But I'm hoping that with you know cleaner mechanisms, you know protocols that have been sufficient trust, like I'm especially thinking of Gnosis Safe, for example, uh, that are, oh, safe now. Sorry, uh, is uh, I think once we have you know sufficiently battle tested primitives like this or Uniswap, we can start thinking about onboarding like the next order of magnitude of users. And I'm really hoping one of those companies you know go big and some on some release to actually connect us to the rest of the world and yeah i, I have a lot of hope in, in those industry leaders and i hope that morpho will also you know be part of, of those very soon which uh, is uh, it is in, in a good uh, way to do so actually cool thank you so much for coming on paul that was very interesting yeah definitely i think probably one of the most interesting and, and you know in-depth podcast I've ever been in. So it was a pleasure sharing that moment with you guys.